Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. Okay, so I have a case for us. Okay. This takes us to Minnesota, up Ooh. in Minnesota. Minnesota. A little chilly up in Minnesota. It is. Here we go. You ready? Yep, I am ready. Suck it to me. Underwood, Minnesota, is a small town America as it gets. Is it Cut. Underwood? Ha, ha, ha. With a population of around 300 people, it's a very rural farmland town, kind of like a one stoplight kind of town. Mm-hmm. May 20th in Minnesota started out just like any other spring day. The kids were getting excited that school was about to be out for summer break. Boy, can I relate to that. Weather was great. That summer feeling was coming on, right? And you're getting all that. That's so excited. That's so exciting. So fun. Spring one of, fever. That's right. One of the residents living the calm life was a 13-year-old little girl named Sarah Ann Reardon. Now, remember, Jen, what's important at 13? Boys. Friends. Netflix. Clothes. Cable. <laughs> boys. Yeah. And puppy love. Mm-hmm. Remember puppy love? It's like, I mean, boys are age 13. You're just and starting to get into the boys. It puppy love. Not us. We've been boy crazy forever. Also at age 13, you realize that this little 13-year-olds think they know everything, mm-hmm. you know, so they're not, they're not a kid anymore, mm-hmm. but they're still far from being an adult. Yet, they think, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a really tough age. That's horrible. I would never pay to go back and do that again. Couldn't pay me to go back again. Yep, I wrote there you that. go. See? Mm-hmm. Yep, sure did. Couldn't pay me. It's horrible. Sarah comes from a large family where she lives with her dad, stepmom, and 10 brothers and sisters. Holy cow. Five of the children were John's. That's her dad. And four were from Marilyn. And Marilyn is her stepmom. Okay. I thought you meant they were John's, like. John is the dad. Like the John's people who go. John's like solicitors of sex workers. Sex workers. That's what I thought you meant. Get your mind out of the gutter. Hey, that's what I thought. Okay. So it was a, a blended so five, family. It's a blended family. So okay. five of the children were John's, which is her dad. And four were Marilyn's, which mm-hmm. is her stepmom. And she was the only one from that marriage? And John and Marilyn had two babies together. Okay. No, Sarah was the only little girl that John had. She okay. was John's. Okay? Gotcha. Okay. I was confused. Even though they had a house full, I c- could not imagine living with that many people. It would drive me crazy. They didn't really have a large house, but instead they had just a little farm, a simple little farm. Now, Sarah's biological mother was not in the picture at all. Mm-hmm. Sarah's father, John, worked as a mechanic to support the large family. And Sarah was his princess. He adored her. She was his only biological daughter. The other siblings were boys. The two were not only close, but since she was John's only daughter, she was kind of his favorite, and people Mm kind of knew it. That kind of happens. The favoritism that they had together, it didn't set too well with the old stepmother, Marilyn. Marilyn was very hard on Sarah, and some would say that Sarah wasn't treated like the other kids. Mm -hmm. Marilyn... I mean, you almost say she bullied her, kind of. Mm-hmm. Make her do extra chores. Evil stepmother from Disney. Yeah, kind yeah. of, you know. Cinderella. Weird jealousy thing going. Oh, it's just weird. But like, it's just, uh, you can tell something's not right. It's really hard to help raise somebody else's child. There's always going to be that. You know what I mean? I think yeah, that would be difficult. I could do it, though. Yeah, but it, you're going to have fights with your spouse because it, that's not how you... You know, he would do things one way and you would want to do it the other way. I have fights with my spouse now with the two kids that we are raising together that are both ours. But I think the thing would be like, that's my kid. Stay out of it. Or the the kid would be like, you're not my mom. Right. There's that angle is what I'm saying. So Sarah's stepmother, Marilyn, wasn't the only person in the house that Sarah was, I don't know how, how do we say, having trouble getting along with. Her 16-year-old stepbrother, Jeff. Now Uh that's Marilyn's son was often at odds with Sarah. He was the oldest in the house, and he, too, could be, I guess, just downright mean to her. Jeff had dropped out of school at 16 already, and he was kind of a wild child with a bit of a mean spirit. He was angry a lot of the time, Mm -hmm. that testosterone in there. And a lot of that would end up coming out on Sarah, right? Of course. The dog that is beaten. I get it. I don't like it, but I understand it. Little Sarah 
was a very good student in school at the Underwood High School where she got good grades and all her teachers really loved her. She was especially good in math and science, and she was playing around with the idea of maybe trying to become a doctor, studying Mm -hmm. medicine. On this fateful day, Sarah went to school looking very cute. And, you know, 13-year-olds, that's right when it kicks in that you start caring about what you wear. Mm -hmm. At 13, she And what year was this? I'm sorry. Did I even say a year? I said May 20th. I don't think I said a year. Because I didn't know if she was, like, fixing her spiral perm and popping her collar. It's uh, it's about that time, I think. Hold in on. In the 80s? Yes, it's in the 80s. I'm going to see. Monday, Monday. So good to me. 1986. 1986. She was like our... I yeah, mean, so she was age. got the spiral perm yep. and the... The on socks. I Mm -hmm. I should have said that earlier. Sorry, people. Sarah went to school that day looking cute. Mm -hmm. And as I just stated, 13, you start caring about what you look like. Set out your little outfits, making sure they look good. Getting new shoes. Like Mm -hmm. you want to go shopping a lot. So on this day, she was wearing jeans and a shirt that had little teddy bears on it. Probably chick jeans. And along with her cute little outfit, bright yellow sneakers. Of course. This is 86. Mm -hmm. The colors. Woohoo. Probably Reeboks, high tops. Sarah and her friend, Joe, stayed at school after the bell had rung to work on a project for class. When they left the school, they would walk over to the Undermart. That's the name of it. Undermart? Undermart, which is a gas station convenience store. Sort of like a Larry's Quick Stop, Jen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very common in small towns, right? People would go there and you'd get your bubble gum and your soda. And if you had enough money, an ice cream sandwich. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So they walked over to the Undermart. And they walk over there and it could be a Mecca for kids, right? Oh, so yeah. that's where all the kids would go. Got to get that Dr. Pepper snacks and candy. After school? Heck yeah. That's right. One of the things the girls picked up at the store that particular day were some water balloons as they mm-hmm. had big plans for a huge water balloon fight on, at school the next day. It's towards the end of the year. So they're doing those little field trips and stuff like that. The girls then walked back to the school where they would hang out for a little bit longer until it was time to go home. At around 5.30, Joe called her sister to come and pick her up. Now, she offered a ride home to Sarah, and Sarah declined, saying that her dad, John, would be coming to get her in moments. Right. Sarah would wait at school for a while, but when John had not shown up, Sarah decided to start walking home. Small town, right? Right. I I walked to him from school all the way up till I could drive. Yeah. I don't think I walked my ninth, eighth grade, till eighth grade. Yeah. I never walked to school. I was always too far away, but... That was not uncommon for everybody. Oh, yeah. Everybody did. I did. And carrying my uh, alto sax. That was a <laughs> pain in the butt. That you would. That you didn't even play. I want to play. I tried to play. No. I no. I'm saying practice. you never played. You just pretended to play oh, yeah. in band. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you drug it back and forth. <laughs> Damn it. Too. You couldn't keep it in there. So Sarah decided to start walking home. You know, at this point, she kind of just figured her dad got busy and mm-hmm. forgot her. But he'd meet her on the way of her walking. Sarah's house was about four miles away from the school, and the road to get there was just what you would expect in this small little town community. The road was traveled by townspeople a lot, Mm -hmm. but it was a bit desolate, sort of a back road. Knowing her father would be, you know, hopping around that corner any minute, she said she was pretty sure she'd just run into him on the way home. No problem, right? Well, being a small town as it is, people would pull over and Hey, Sarah, you want to ride? You know, she knew him and stuff. And she said, no, because her dad's going to be there any minute. She just knew it. So we fast forward. It's now 7 p.m. Mm. Okay. And the phone rings. It's John who is calling from nearby Fergus Falls. And he asked Marilyn. Hey, I have a friend that lives in or lived in Fergus Falls. Do you? Yeah. Eric. Oh. From Facebook. Oh, yeah. Eric from Facebook. Fergus Farms Facebook. Mm -hmm. He unfriended me, though. He unfriended almost everybody. Why? I don't know. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's probably something you said. Oh, I'm sure. No. He went through and unfriended a lot of people. I'm just saying. Okay. Call me Eric. (laughs) Collect. So it's now around 7 p.m. when Mm -hmm. the phone rings. And it's Sean who's calling from nearby Fergus Falls, asking Marilyn if she needed anything from the store as he's on his way home. Huh. Realizing that Sarah was supposed to be home by now and was not, Marilyn informs John that Sarah's not home. So the miscommunication is starting to show appear, right? Mm-hmm. At 7.30, John arrives home. Marilyn and John discuss what to do about Sarah not being home yet. 
the couple decide that John will stay at home and wait for Sarah in case, you know, she comes home, while Marilyn and her son Jeff would go out and look around for her. Hmm. Now, Jeff remembers the one that... that no, I know, but I would think it would be the other way around. As would I, my friend. Mm-hmm. I'm getting a bit suspicious. <laughs> Something's a mess I've here. I've got my suspicious eyes on. Without locating Sarah, Marilyn and Jeff return home. The family knows that they now, they have to call the police. I mean, mm-hmm. this is getting way too late. And Sarah is still, you know, she's a freshman in high school. She's right? a kid. So a call is placed by John to the Otter Tail County Sheriff's Office, informing them that Sarah had never returned home after school. Detective Chuck Shearbrook was placed in charge of the case and immediately sent out cars to look for Sarah. The family would fill out a missing persons report, as is per usual. The police start with the family first and then go mm-hmm. outward. You start with right. your tiny little circle and you make go it out. bigger as you go. Because why? Because that's how you do it. And it's normally somebody in the family. It's always somebody you're close to. Truth. More often than not. I learned that from Dateline. You did? hmm I also learned that if you have a smile that lights up the room, you're going to die. Yeah. Or, from somebody close to you. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. So don't smile to light up the room. Or And the neighbors. Don't be the quiet neighbor that kept no. to yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't be that one either. Well, they're the one that's do that too. Same. So as police sit the couple down, John would do much of the talking with Marilyn sitting by his side. The police learned that Joe, that was her friend that she was with, Mm -hmm. could have been, in fact, the last person to actually see her visually alive. Besides her killer. Besides her killer. Or abducted. At at this point, because they don't know that people were asking her for rides as well. They race over to Joe's house to question her. By the time they get there, it was just after midnight. Mm. Seems like they're taking a long time, but I guess whatever. It's got to be thorough. Joe's mom went upstairs to wake up Joe and ask about Sarah. Joe was shocked and had no idea that Sarah never made it home that day. Joe went over with police every detail that happened that day, including times and locations, as well as what Sarah was wearing. Mm -hmm. As is normal, fear begins to creep in as news of Sarah's disappearance was hitting town, hitting the high school, hitting the kids' information, neighbors, all that stuff. Whispers in the hallways of Underwood High filled the hallways. The story was slowly getting out that a young girl disappeared on her way home. Volunteers arrived to help search for Sarah, and the sheriff's office put people on horses to get through some of that dense terrain out there. Mm -hmm. Helicopters were sent up, and dogs were sent out. Everybody wanted to find Sarah. I should hope so. Media. Media. (laughs) Media begins to swarm the small town, and John makes a plea on TV to find his missing daughter. Marilyn begs viewers to please find her, get some answers, even if it's bad. That's better than not knowing. Hmm. There, it was a tearful, Susan Smith esque, a little thing. bit, just a little. Who's to say how people react in that? Exactly. The hope of finding Sarah alive is slowly beginning to fade. So during this time, Jen, you'll remember the Amber Alert system had not yet been created. However, there was something new that had started in 1984 that may be helpful in finding young Sarah. A missing six-year-old boy named Eton Pates went missing from New York. Do you remember Mm -mm. Eton? Yes, you do. You do. Okay. In an effort to find the missing boy, his face was placed on milk cartons. Ah, yes, I remember that. My name on him. They just just found who did this, that brutally molested him and killed him, and he went missing. Six-year-old, the parents decided, I can walk to the bus by myself. Yeah. six. You know the story. I know the story. There was a movie. Yeah. Pedro Hernandez. Yep. Was he the storekeeper or something? Or like neighbor? Sentenced to 25 years to life for killing him. Yeah, he got 25 years out since it happened. Like, you know what I mean? He got mm-hmm. to live his life. In small town Underwood, Jen, people mm-hmm. never thought that one of their own would be featured on a milk carton featuring a missing child. I mean, that is terrible. That was heartbreaking. Underwood would adapt the milk carton idea and change it up just a bit. They created bottle hangers you know like the little i don't like the little advertisements that you would hang over bottles and they Mm -hmm. started putting that on pepsi cola products two liter bottles and things like that Mm -hmm. so in all the area stores you would find her missing information much like the milk carton but it was like on a tag that they would put on the sodas the idea worked awesomely it worked great all these tips started coming in like we know how that goes right Mm -hmm. lots of the uh 
crazies. Crazos call in and do that, right? Yeah, it's pretty brave to do one, I would think, because you have to sort through all the craziness to find a good lead. Speaking of good lead, thanks for the segue Mm -hmm. there, Jen. You're welcome. Uh, Some seem fake, but one came in on May 22nd, and it would shed some new light on the disappearance of Sarah. A person claiming to be the neighbor of their Reardon's phones police and says that he saw Sarah walking on Whiskey Road. I think had a Whiskey Road. I think every small town has a Whiskey Road. How funny is that? Whiskey Road, the very day she disappears. He said that there was a green Chevrolet that had been in front of him at the time he saw Sarah on the road. So like they're driving down. Right. There's like a green Chevy in front of him and he sees the little girl on the road. He said that the car slowed down because it went past Sarah, Mm -hmm. slowed down. Then it turned into um, uh, a road and like turned around. And then as he was passing, the car had made a U-turn, a, like a U-turn, a, a turn in, turn out, whatever. And then headed back the other direction, which would be the direction back to Sarah. And he probably thought, well, he probably knows the person. Right. And Maybe he went on by. 300 people. My I God, know. what are you doing in the town? I would suspect the same thing. All right. So police were pretty, they were pretty pumped. They thought this is a good tip, right? They waste no time and begin to run all the plates in Minnesota. Belonging to a green Chevy car. Mm-hmm. How hard could that be? Well, it turned out that was a very popular car with hundreds of cars in the state. Right. That was, was a green Chevy that. from the state of Minnesota. So tips continued to pour in as they were working on that and trying to narrow down all the cars. Police began to wonder at this point what happened to little Sarah. I would think they, I would hope they'd be was wondering it, since the very I first think they, time. They start thinking different things, you know. Was it a stranger abduction? Did, Did she they take away? her? Did she run away? Was it a boyfriend? Maybe her biological mother. Remember, she's Came not in. Back. The, she's not in the picture. So they're all this is coming back, and that would make sense that that you know, being a little angry that the father had custody of her. However, it wouldn't be long before they would have an answer, but not the one they were hoping for. On July sixth, seven weeks after her disappearance, a farmer's working his fields mm. about. 30 miles from where Sarah had first disappeared or that, that road she was walking. So we, it's quite a ways. Like he is, the farm is located 30 miles from where that whiskey road would be. About a 45 minute drive probably around. The man notices something in the field. And as he gets closer, he can tell by the smell, um, but you know, you're a farmer, that something's not right. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, when he got there, he noticed it was what he had suspected was the case. It's a small little body decomposing wearing a shirt with two teddy bears on it. Uh, Could you imagine? No, that's heartbreaking. No pants, no shoes, just a t-shirt. The search for Sarah was over, but the investigation was just amping up. The town came together to put little Sarah to rest and continued to wonder who could do this and why. Why would you do this to this little 13-year-old in a small town? An autopsy was performed on Sarah, and it determined that the petite-framed teen had been stabbed in the stomach area. Mm. A hole in her teddy bear shirt showed that she was stabbed through the shirt. Meaning mm. the shirt never came off, right? Right. It's a teddy bear shirt with the stabbing. I know. I mean, it's just like... Ugh. 13. Police knew that they really had to dig in and focus on that green Chevy that was spotted on the road the day Sarah disappeared. Police are able to track down a man and pull him in for questioning. The man says, Why, yes, I do travel that road. For work, and in fact, I do recall turning around in a driveway. The only thing is, the man was not on the road that day. Oh. In fact, he was not even in town. Sarah disappeared on a Monday, but the man had traveled that road the previous day on Sunday mm. and made that turn. So he's not the person that they are looking for. Maybe the person who called in the tip could be. <laughs> Police rushed back into square one. It's now August. It's been a month after Sarah's body was recovered and several months since she went missing. Her poor dad. Her father, John, goes public again, but this time to help raise awareness about families with missing children. So he really wanted to put himself out there, put his face out there that, you know, when a child goes missing, Mm -hmm. the family suffers, the siblings suffer. Everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. 
John would, in fact, become the poster boy for sort of the missing children's family members, right? So you're a missing, much like, you know, moms have murdered children or something like that. It's it's sort of like a, a thing, a group. John would begin making appearances and giving speeches and even working with the attorney general, all in the effort to get more publicity on families of missing kids. As John is making the rounds, a shocking twist was about to come to light. Dun, dun, dun. When Sarah was reported missing, all her belongings that were left at school in her locker had been taken by investigators. Mm-hmm. And in there, they found what seemed to be a kid's school notebook, right? Regular notebook? Just a regular, like a little composition notebook. At first glance, the book seemed to be the ramblings of a teen girl. I love him. He loves me. I, I can't live without him. Mrs. Camille. Robert Lowe. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mrs. Mm-hmm. Lowe. Mrs. Camille Lowe. Rob and Camille Lowe. It's so mm-hmm. true. Oh, I know. Poetry, doodles, random boys' names. But there was something else because they went back to this, you know, when first collected, it seemed pretty normal. But that my stepmom sucks. Yeah. Type being stuff. being tossed back to mm-hmm. zero. Right. You know, you gotta start over. So they pull out this stuff and they start looking at it again and they see something. In the notebook, Sarah talked about dying mm. and death, as well as begging for, quote, somebody not to kill her, oh. end quote. The notes as Someone well. Someone not to kill her? Not to kill her. The notes, as well as Sarah often wanting to stay after school rather than going home, threw up more than just a few red flags. I would think so. Because, you know, these, I don't know, like these kids today are so email and things like that, like that sort of a thing but this was and I you I don't know oh. you just that kind of thing you just didn't say you know what I mean not back then no. now it's always brought up I just want to die it would be so much better they, if I was dead they use that slang and stuff and I don't think they think about what they're saying no, they don't have the life experience to know how truly awful saying something like that is exactly after the detectives find this and they too find it a little odd they decided to go back and re-examine the family dynamics as well as ask some more questions to the family members to see, like, why would she say this? Why would she be upset? Why would she not want to be home? During this visit, the police notice one of the members of the household is not very hmm, cooperative with answering hmm. questions. You want to guess who that would be? Uh, Probably the boy or the stepmom. It's the boy, Jeff. Jeff was being very vague about details that should be very clear. Friends and family knew that Jeff and Sarah would often fight, even physically fight, Now police want to know if that somebody in Sarah's journal was, in fact, her stepbrother, Jeff. Could Jeff leave the house that day? Could he have run into Sarah on the road where they got into another big fight and he harmed her in some sort of How old is he? 16. Mm. She's 13. So he had a driver's license. He had a driver's license. Quit school. Oh. Remember? Mm -hmm. As he was in the past interviews, Jeff is not giving police very much information. He's not revealing much at all, in fact. But that's going to change. It's about to change. The stress of being young, again, he's just 16, and having these grown adult detectives drilling you nonstop with questions finally caused him to break. What Jeff was about to tell them would stun detectives. Jeff admitted that he had tried to force Sarah into having sex with him. There you go. But he swore he did not have anything to do with her murder. Police tend to believe Jeff at this moment because Jeff did not have a driver's license to transport Sarah. There you go. We said he was 16, but he didn't Mm -hmm. have a driver's license to transport Sarah from that road in which she was last seen to the field where she was found, which I had said was 30 miles away. Right. Marilyn also said that Jeff was home with her as well as the other kids that day during the afternoon. Marilyn might lie for her. You think? I don't know. Would you ever lie for your kid? No. I wouldn't either. After... Marilyn says mm-hmm. that Jeff is with her. And I guess with nothing else to lose, the police decide, hey, you know what? We're going to recheck the family members' alibis that day. Just make sure that we all Smart the move. T's are crossed and ots, tot, ots are dotted. Mm-hmm. I's are dotted. At the start of the investigation, police believed what they were told about the locations of where all the family members were. But perhaps they shouldn't have been so trusting. And I guess in a population of 300 
as an officer, you know everybody. Now, if you did the town have them, their own police department, or did they? I, I'm sure they did, but it's tiny, and they're not used to something like they're this. Not, you, you I know? would doubt that there'd be more than one murder. I, every I would two think decades. maybe three or four officers, if that, and right. probably the volunteer firemen that we yeah. had in our small little town. You volunteered part of your time to be the fireman. <laughs> you know, you're like the yeah. you worked at the post office or at Walmart, but then you were also the volunteer, right? Firemen. So I'm no, guessing I would that's probably something like doubt that. that any of these had any kind of expertise. Right. It would be during this next set of questioning that police would learn yet another family secret. When Sarah's sepsis, blah, blah, blah. it's a doozy. I thought you said sepsis. Right. Sep- sepsis. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No. What? The evil stepsisters. Yeah. They're not evil, though. Just wait. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to shit. shit. You're going to go. die. Well, wait. Is it going to shit or is it going to die? die? First it's going to shit and then it's, it's going to die. die. When Sarah's stepsisters were being questioned by police, mm-hmm. the girls told officers that mm, everything was not quite as it seemed. Oh, nice. You see, one of the sisters had walked into a room one casual day where John was having sex with his daughter, Sarah. John, the father. The father. Detectives are shocked and sickened. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's a shocker. So now they realize that they must get to John before he finds out that one of his stepchildren had just told police this information. Oh, yeah. Detectives call John at work and tell him he needs to come home immediately where they're waiting for him. Right. That's so gross. Upon arriving home, Lieutenant Kausler and Agent Jacobson were waiting for him. They didn't hesitate and came straight out asking him if he was having sex with his daughter. At first, John denied it, but soon he ended up confessing that they did have something going on. But it only happened once. Uh, That's one too many times. Uh Uh-huh. That poor girl. Of course, as police pressed him, that one time changed to 10 times and then to 20 times, which we all know it's way more than that. That's not having sex. He raped his oh, daughter. He molested her. That's terrible. She's 13. Well, it's terrible anyway, but I mean, she, that's full it's on his daughter. rape. Daughter. It's rape. Yeah. He raped her that he wasn't having sex with her. He raped her. While John admits to the sexual abuse, he too, just like Jeff, swears he had nothing to do with Sarah's death. Hmm. Again, police note that John had an alibi as he was helping a farmer change a tire on his farm. That leaves one person. They had confirmed that alibi earlier. And John had, in fact, been doing just what he said he was doing. Mm -hmm. He was helping that farmer. They had confirmed that with the farmer that day. So really at a loss, police, they're kind of like scratching their heads. I know who did it. I don't, they don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. So again, they're like, we just have to start all over, uh, start all over, right? Maybe they missed something that first time. Let's run out to the farmer to confirm John's story, which the farmer had done previously, Mm -hmm. right? But let's ask him a couple more questions. They venture back out to the farmer's house. Police arrive to the farmer's house to ask the farmer a few more questions. One of these questions was a simple one. Could you show us where on your farm, which field, this area right here, were you located when John was helping you change the tire on one of your machines? Mm -hmm. Farmer says, of course, that'd be great. I'd I'd love to show you. Come with me. Oh, but you know, we're going to have to drive there, drive to the field. And police are like, uh, pardon me? Yeah, you see, the tire was not on his farm. It was on a farm. Mm. It was on another person's farm, a farm that he rented out to other people to to farm the land. I guess, you know, sharecropping is mm-hmm. what that used to be called. I'm not so sure if it is anymore. So it was a, a land that he rented to somebody, and that happens to be where? Where her body was found. It's in Underwood, the town where Sarah lived. Mm-hmm. The farm was only four miles from oh, where... Oh, so it wasn't where her body was found. The farm in which he helped change that tire right was only four miles from where sarah disappeared not 30 oh gotcha this revelation meant that john had plenty of time to take sarah and eventually kill her right because they were thinking it was the 30 30 miles miles where her body was found yeah and it wasn't right it was actually close yes police lay into him and they're furious right Um, and so finally he admits i killed sarah John then tells police to check the red toolbox in his truck and take the owl, which is similar to an ice pick. I had to look it up. Owl. Oh, an owl. A- yep. A-W-L. An owl. It's actually called an 
I all. like an owl better. I think it sounds better. But if you pronounce it all. I don't care. That's how I pronounce it, Jennifer. Shut okay. up. It's an all. So he's going to take the owl that's pronounced like a bird, and he is going to tell them to check his toolbox for that because, you know, there might be a little bit of blood on it. Maybe that's what Michael Peterson. I know. That's why I said it that way. And with that, John breaks down and tells the authorities exactly what happened that faithful May 20th day. John tells police he picked up Sarah as she was walking home that day. This is going to make you furious. Oh, I'm already pissed. He would drive a few miles out of town to an old vacant house, which police believe is where he would take Sarah previously to molest her, rape her, have relations with her. Rape her. It's rape. This day it would be different because Sarah, she's 13. She's about to be a sophomore in high school, and she actually tells her father no. John gets extremely angry. Sarah hops out of the truck, and she begins running. She's running through this field. She begins? Begins. John gets very angry, and Sarah... She's running with the owl? No. She begins to run with the owl? No, she doesn't have that. He does. He kills her with the ding-dong. Stay stay with the story, people. kidding. John got... Yeah, but see, you messed this all up, then. I gotta go back and read it again. Now the people already know what's happening. You just ruined it. I think you know ruined it. Ruins it with the T. John got angry and Sarah hopped out of the car and began running. John would chase her, catch her, and then stab her in the stomach. Now, he just killed his biological daughter, whom he had been raping, right? Mm-hmm. He returns home to his waiting family. Pretends that it's all. As Sarah is lying in a field, dying. Mm-hmm. Did I say that right? Maybe it's laying. Maybe it has lain in the field and died. Did he drug her there? I don't know. Drag, I put, drug. I put little Sarah lie dying in a field. That's right. Wait, you lay a rug and you lie like a dog. Yes. Sarah lie dying in the field. As Sarah was lying. The couple makes the plans to search for Sarah. Okay. So uh-huh. she's there. Ding dong knows he did this. Right. And so does. he's going to stay there. This even irritates me more because it's like you lazy SOB. You're going to stay here and you're going to send your stepson and your wife out to mm-hmm. shoot to go look for Sarah knowing you did it, and you're going to wait here for the phone call? Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But John would not stay home. That's the difference. That was the plan. He was going to stay home, right? That was the plan. But he knew, crap, I I can't do this. He gets back into his truck, and he returns to Sarah. He wraps her up in some material, and he travels to Rothsay. If I'm saying that wrong, I apologize. Rothsay, Minnesota, where he threw his daughter into a ditch. And that would be the farm in which she was found, Ugh. 30 miles away from the house. Was he afraid, I guess, she was going to talk? He was in such a hurry. He would literally left her, like, in the middle of the field. So he knew right. that I have to go. There's going to be people looking for her tonight. They could see her. I got to make it, right. I, I got to hide her better, right? Now, let me take you back to earlier, because you haven't mentioned this yet, which kind of surprised me. This was the man that had been all over TV, Mm -hmm. the poster boy crying. Susan Smith. For his daughter's safe return and then playing it up and becoming an advocate for families with missing children. Mm -hmm. And he was, in fact, the The very person responsible for killing that. Susan Smith. Sweet, beautiful little 13-year-old girl. Remember all the time she's on TV crying? My poor boys, my poor babies. Mm -hmm. Now, his wife, Marilyn, would claim that she never knew that John was molesting his daughter. Her daughter, her stepdaughter. But, there's signs. But she there's, knew. there's a little postscript to this little story here. John would be charged with first degree murder as well as criminal sexual assault conduct in the mm. first degree. After a three week long trial, John was convicted for the murder and sexual abuse of Sarah Ann Reardon. He was sentenced to life in prison. Good. Oh, just wait. Marilyn Reardon would be indicted just four days after John was sentenced to life. So after he was sentenced to life, she would be indicted for... Covering it up? No. Allowing and permitting the assault of a child or children. Now, it never said which child that was, but I mean, hello, that's obvious. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing. They never said that. And also, she had remarried. She had divorced him. She had remarried the week prior to John's sentencing. So she married... The week before he got sentenced. He was, right. And then four days after that, she was indicted. Okay. And the indictment, as I said, didn't name a specific child, but it was obviously Sarah. And by the way, that is a misdemeanor charge. Because she let it happen in her house? That she, yes, and neglect, basically. So let me just end this humdinger of a story by this. See, I thought she was going to be the one that killed her because she was jealous of... Mm -hmm. The husband mm-hmm. sleeping with her. I thought the... it was the teenager. Yeah. Ugh, it's disgusting. 
So we need to put this on our blog, and we really do, because I about threw up when I saw this. Mm -hmm. This would not be the last we heard of good old Johnny Boy, right? Mm -hmm. In 1991, he agreed to do a sit-down interview with a television show called Confessions of a Crime. (sighs) Okay, and it is apparent he loves the spotlight, you know? He just likes getting all that attention. I mean, he's the one that was on there crying about his daughter and being an advocate for missing families and all that. During the interview... You can see just how cold and callous this man is. And John, you know, was loved as do- doted on his daughter. She was his she favorite. Did. All this, right? And everybody knew how much he's a good father, good family man. He supporting loved her all as a way kids. a father should never love his child. So during the sit-down interview, he's asked about Sarah. How he, you know, if he thinks of her often, that kind of stuff. And this is his comment. And it's a quote. I don't really think of Sarah very often. I really don't. But I just can't change the past. What? End quote. Basically, they're just, I just don't think of her. I just can't change the past. So why should I think of her? Are you kidding me? Father of the year right there, buddy. Usually when you're in prison, you tend to rethink your crimes. You'd and you think, try right? to get rebuil- no. rehabilitated for no. it. And no. you have I mean, if, if that's some not remorse, obvious that, uh, you know. He's a psychopath? Yep. Ding, ding, ding. That's horrible. That's what my story bastard. for you, Jim. What a bastard, right? Just, you should see this in it. Like, he's just, yeah, I just don't think of her very often. It is your daughter, and she's dead, and you killed her. How do you not think about do her? Do you think he was trying to be, play it cool, or? I don't know. I think he's trying to play it jerk. But does he, is he up for any type of parole, or no, is it I life in prison without well, parole? Well, it's, it's 25 years to life, but he's. Not with, if I he's not remorseful. I want to say he come up. I can't even remember, because my cases are getting confused, but I think. I want to say he might have been up for it already three times, but then that last time he took himself out of the running. But I'm not sure if that's him or not, because like I said, I can't, I write like several of these at a time. So if I said that before in another, in another case, then it's not him. <laughs> Good research. Yeah. It is. I just can't remember because that was like from what I read in my head. What about the mom, the stepmom? Did she get sentenced or anything? No, that's a misdemeanor. You don't get anything for oh. that. Like maybe pay a fine, but that's it. So she remarried like quickly. Obviously. Well, the trial could have taken years, too. You didn't say how long it was. I didn't take that long. But, I mean, you're going to stay at the guy that's molesting his own child? Mm -mm. Which really makes me wonder that he didn't molest his stepdaughters. Because that's more... Well, he was probably... Often happens than your daughter. Right? Not necessarily. His daughter's more apt to do anything he says more than your stepdaughter would be. You're not my real dad. I'm not doing anything that you want to do. You can't tell me what to do. Plus, he probably had been sleeping with her for more than 20 times it's probably been a lot it's longer a, yeah and you know the mom i believe the mom was out of the picture due to drugs and stuff like that so then it made me think that like when she became out of the picture he made sarah be like the substitute wife you know we've heard that story before i don't know it's just absolutely awful. he could have been molesting her for years and she finally stood up and wasn't going to take yeah, it when she's 13 i mean you start to, you know you're starting to like boys and that i get that you, you're not so helpless anymore. You don't right. think, you know. They had an interview with a um, poor baby. teacher head, put it in the police officer's heads because he's like, you know, I knew something was wrong because no 13-year-old wants to stay after school till we close down and kick them out. And mm-hmm. she did anything she wanted to do. And he's kind of the one that gave put them, the yeah, the like lead. gave them that lead that, that that indicates there's problems at home. Right. But nobody would ever think that your father would, I mean, you just don't think that. But nowadays, okay, now you're a teacher. Do. If the, it what happened to you, time. would you have to report that? I'm a mandated reporter. I have to. Right. I would be sued. Right. I could go to jail. So if you would find that a little girl, say her name's Tiffany, yeah. would stay and you sus- suspected that something was happening, you didn't know for sure, she never spoke to you about it, but you just thought, well, God, it's really weird that she never mm-hmm. wants to go home. Mm-hmm. Would no, you no, have I, to? You, I pull her out and talk to her. I've done it before. Pull right. them out, talk to them in the hallway. And kids can't lie to save their life. That's why they just can't. I could. It, no, you can't. You just, they, the pressure. They cave. All you got to do is pretend like you know already. And they cave. I had to do, I went through that with a kid. And it was terrible. I cried for like three days because she was telling me that her parents were molesting her and beating her up. Okay, correction. She didn't say molest. Beating her up. But she had indicated that there was some molesting going on. So I was freaking out. And then I went and told the principal. And the principal, I'm sitting there crying. And the principal's like, I have to call her down here. And just stone cold face, 
the principal was like, I have to call your parents. And she's like, can I at least go home first and talk to them? And principal's like, no, we're going to do it right now, right here. And I think she was a habitual pathological liar. Mm -hmm. And then so her parents were mad at me because Mm -hmm. can't get into all this, but they were thinking that I was having her stay at school and do all these long activities till eight o'clock at night. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I have little kids because this was several years ago. I'm like, three o'clock. I'm out of here. I leave at three. And so she was lying to them. and She was lying to me. And just it was it was horrible. But I you have to do it. Had to go tell. And then it's just. So back then, I wonder if the teacher would have had to report things like you did. I wonder if that could have all been solved. If he would have reported it before John killed her. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't he, have the mandated reporting. Right. Back then, but, he, but you I, said he suspected mm-hmm. it. So I just wondered if he would have reported it. If it would have been. If yeah. it could have been solved before she ended up dead in the field. I just can't imagine a father. I can't imagine a parent killing their child can't imagine. I have visions of me smacking them upside the head, but that's in my head and it's just right there because they're annoying me. I keep thinking, you know what? It's too late to take them to the fire department and drop them off. Too big for that, Jen. They don't fit in that box. They can't do it. But no, it's... Just kidding. But to actually, some days I do. I always like them. Well, no, I always love them. I might not like them. them. You don't like them, yeah. But no, that's... There's a problem with all of it. To find a child sexually attractive or them want to have sex with a child you know i don't even know if it's dad i think it's almost power for the dad i don't know i don't understand like any of that she's 13 my god and i'm sure it had been going on for a while i could guarantee you it was going more than 20 times but see and that's the thing like the wife not knowing like there had to be other signs knew yeah the wife knew you know you know what's up you know you know what's happening horrible is that kid, just horrible? For that the most baby. part, kids can't lie. I mean, you can break them, right? Little telltale signs. Not me. Could never break yeah, me. Yeah, I could. I Detroit couldn't. could. Betcha I could. Mm-mm. Anyway, I just flipped Camille off, by the way, for those. She's not the mean attention. one. I keep telling people I that. I am not the listen. mean one. You are. I'm the jokester. Right, whatever. All right, I've been here for five hours. I think that's enough time. <laughs> time for me to go <laughs> oh, home now. I love you, too. Well, just anyway, now. we love you guys. Thanks, buddies. We love you, buddies. Kiss your animals for us. Or for me, Camille hates animals. <laughs> Not really. I just hate you. I know. All right. Love you guys. Yeah. Bye. bye. bye.